Hi, I'm Vladimir. I run like the indie development company called Cold Wild Games. I think it was for seven years, but can we switch to the next one, please? Okay, the slide is left intentionally blank, and I guess the backstory is Laura asked me to tell me to tell you who I am. So let's start with this one. Next slide. Right. So hi, my name is Vladimir. I am mostly um, right. I started out as a software engineer. And uh, afterwards, I think I worked for corporate um, for a corporate development for five years, maybe. Then I got bored of it, and uh, life lost its meaning. So, in the end, I just decided and quit, and started making games. First, it was mostly me doing stuff and contracting people. In the end, uh, it was me and Helen, and then it was uh, the, the designer. And then the studio kind of grew naturally after the release of Merchant of the Skies in 12, 2019. Um, I think it's enough about me. Next, please. Right. At one point, and if you actually want like, to take a look into the business insight, I suppose the more useful part would be to look my, at my presentation called Aesthetic Driven Design, um, which... I should have spoken at GDC 2020, but you know what happened in 2020, so we don't talk about it. But it's on YouTube, on the GDC channel. Wow, my highlight, my five minutes of fame. <sighs> Do you think like how, how, thank you. Can I just, what if I press the wrong button? Man, I'm terrible at tech. I tried pressing the arrows. Sorry, I'm a bit of a boomer. Which part do you point? Okay, those two. Do you just point them? To th do you point them at computer? No. Okay. Okay, it worked. <laughs> yes, Simonis, you're still on board. Like the automation will not take our jobs away. Please, uh, slide set the next slide. Right. Okay. So yeah, it was my talk. I guess now I feel a bit like a football player who left the field, but um, I'm still here. So let's get going. Simonis, thank you very much. So what is called Wild Games? We, the company itself started as a two-person team. Then there are eight people. We mostly make indie games. Our biggest games are Merchant of the Skies and Luna's Fishing Garden. I will tell a bit about them later. I suppose this is an indie game company, if you can name it this way. We basically just post games on Steam and uh, on consoles, I suppose, if this is the case. Am I using, I suppose, two twice? Uh, Simonis, can you open the next slide, please? Right, so Coldwell Games, the principles behind the company is this is how it runs pretty much now. Uh, we like to experiment with the game genres. We try to add something to the mix, um, even if it's about small details, and the games are really about experiencing things and just feeling stuff and just uh, trying to pass this feeling towards uh, others and to connect uh, with the world through them. I suppose this deserves extra, extra mention, but uh, we really didn't want to have any loot box or casino mechanics like the paid ones, um, which we mask as games. So this is a no for us. We don't toy with blockchain. I guess the overall vision is to try to make a world a better place, even though it's, it's useless. I guess, um, yeah. Even Haze Hayao Miyazaki says it. I kind of seen it from him, I suppose, and it impressed me when I was a kid. Like, when you create something, think of how it impacts the world or anything. Right, we kind of treat the games aesthetically and we try to make them pleasing and good looking because this is often the key to catch the attention. But uh, I don't think I'm comfortable pu 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 publishing the game without good gameplay. Right, can we pass to the next slide, please? Okay, so I guess the biggest game so far has been Merchant of the Skies, which has been released in 2019. This is exact, uh, a simple trading simulator, and uh, you fly the ship around, sell items, gather resources, and build your own trend train company. This is literally what the slide says. Um, it was peaceful, it was wholesome. I think it touched the niche that other players wanted but did not were not getting and uh, it kind of worked and uh, it brought towards the studio expansion so but are we actually a one-hit wonder 
Next slide, please. Right, so at one point, um, yeah, the next one was Luna's Fishing Garden. I think it followed the same principle. It was peaceful, it was wholesome. Uh, it was built like a fairy tale designed to capture attention. We kind of captured, uh, not captured, we managed to get a really talented crew on board from different countries. And uh, by the work of talent, it worked out. I no longer feel like a one-hit wonder. Thank you for the affirmation, Luna's Fishing Garden. Carry on, please. Right, so I suppose afterwards it was a bit of an existential question because do I want to make wholesome games all my life? I think even though both of them sold more than 30,000 copies, I still want to have sort of the experiments and to see how we can use the combat or violence as a storytelling tool, but not gratuitously, I suppose. Um, so Stories of the Outbreak is the game about zombie apocalypse, and Riga is uh, the one that we are developing right now. Um, yep. Next, please. Right, so about the platforms, I think one of the core things that we have focused on early on, even before Merchant of the Skies, is trying to diversify and publish stuff on multiple platforms, which we will touch a bit later. Next, please. Right, so the big bamboozle. Um, I suppose this is where it takes a bit of a turn. Uh, at one point, Laura has asked me if I would be willing to share how to start a company. I suppose it's a bit different from how to run a company and how to run a business. So this is where, <sighs> where this part starts. I don't know, it caused me so much anxiety. I'm super anxious right now. So to put the stress right away, right a bit, we will move to the next slide. And actually, like these are the successful companies in Latvia. Like if you want like a good business advice, how to run a business, like ask those guys. And uh, if I forgot anyone, like, um, no, yeah. So this is what, like, go on, <laughs> go on, like. Next question. Right, Simonis, please. Okay, so this is not a financial advice, l really. Like, uh, no idea what I'm doing. Uh, there's no business education. I cannot help you, like, when it comes to money. Like, uh, go take, take a micro loan or something. That would be, like, a more, um, more. I just have fun, okay? Carry on. Right, so what is Caldwell Games? It's, if it's not run it as a business, I guess, I like money, but I don't optimize for money. Like uh, the current runway is six months, but this is if we start getting like zero amount of money. Like how how is it possible? Never mind. Okay, so I guess for me, Cold Wild Games is about the vision of the better world and to see how far we can go with it. And uh, I suppose one thing that I encourage is work-life balance. Um, I kind of don't get the small companies that like earn millions and then their colleagues don't earn like a fraction of that. I suppose I'm not a fan of trickle down economy, but um, so I guess if the project succeeds for me, I just want everyone who worked on the project to read the benefits of it. All of the employees get the percentage of the game from the profits. And uh, I suppose this is my own vision of home uh, in a general way, how I work or where I live and uh, I presume, I assume if I put on the effort on making the environment around me better, rather than building fences, I suppose uh, something becomes home, and this is how you get the feeling of being home. And uh, it is about values overall. So what are the actual values? Come on. Okay, Sima, just carry on. I'm fine. Right, so in theory, I just think that uh, games should be an experience to everyone. I mentioned this. The developers are co-owners of the games they make. I am super pro-inclusive in stuff, and uh, there's no judgment. At least I tried not to do it. I mean, theoretically, we're all judgmental, but I guess it's about your intellectual checks and balances, and I try to pursue it. Um, I try to be empathetic about the people who work with us, and I try to have a dialogue within the company. If that comes, sorry. Are you messing with me? Okay, thank you. Right, so I guess um, 
since 2022, like it's pretty obvious that Ukraine should win this, and this cannot be a stalemate because it's an existential fear, I suppose. So yes, we've donated stuff, and uh, in general, within the studio, I think it's about the things that brings us together rather than divide us. And uh, I don't know if we have like a super arguments and stuff, but there is a radical honesty. If someone doesn't like something, we say it, or at least I try to maintain it, or uh, maybe I'm the asshole, just. Uh, bashes everything so yeah profit shares goes to employees uh, we try to give them the local game developers and artists um, the opportunity to work with it we've donated to relief organizations and uh, I worked with nine different citizens from different countries uh, Latvia New Zealand Belarus Germany United States Estonia Russia Indonesia Spain this is until yeah, until now so yep um, in the end, I just want the Call of the Games to be an umbrella of talent, and this is how it's built. Uh, if someone is talented, they get a chance to participate in the studio, if we have the resources to do so. And uh, yeah, ideally it's a work on a common project, but I really want to see people who I work with grow as people, as uh, artists, as developers. Right, and the actual principles that are already Im implemented, like 30 to 60 per profits of one game, profits, not income goes towards developers who worked on it. And I do not claim any rights on uh, the work that people do outside of work. And if someone actually wants to use their art after work, then we can run it through and we can discuss it. Um, right, so the part where we're actually here. So you make an indie games. This is a shitty advice. Um, don't do it if you just want to make it. I guess make it, but don't make it as a business. Right, so Number one thing, realize the cost of opportunity. Let's look at the seven years. Um, I have a portfolio of games that I'm really proud of. I have a freedom to work and do what I want. And you probably will have to if you do it. And you're probably going to have a lot of fun. But if I would not be making games, I would have, like moderately speaking, maybe quarter a million euro more right now. Uh, I would spend more time with parents and friends. I would definitely have less anxiety. If I wasn't here, I wouldn't have an anxiety right now, come to think of it. But um, yeah, in the end, ask yourself if you would be doing something better than like doing what you are doing now. If you have anything better to do now, like go somewhere else. Not, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be hurt, but I'm not going to be offended. Basically, if I go to the meetup, I think, is there anything else that I can do which is going to be more fun than a meetup? And then apply this principle to making games or to living your life. This is how it works. So it's not about the profits, it's about like minimizing pain from missing out. Wow. That's pretty depressing. Right, but if you actually make stuff, you should maximize your chances by investing in good art. I cannot believe, no, I, I'm not gonna say the cliche, but basically if you have any amount of resources and you want to make games and you have a friend who is an artist and you can pay him, then pay for the art. Because uh, even our most, I think, Rebel, Lazy Galaxy Rebel Story was, I think, our most uh, unsuccessful game in a way after, after we started doing this seriously and not as a part-time thing. But it still covered it ex 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 its expenses because it was pretty cheaply made in terms of uh, resources spent. And after three or four years, it broke even and you actually get the money back. So if you can invest into making the game, you're in this for the long term, for the long time, and just buy some cool art, make some good simple game, and just wait it out a bit if you... I guess that's my experience with all of the stuff. Your, your mileage may vary. Not a financial advice, but honestly, I haven't seen any decently, like, simple, cheap games made with decent art fail. Um, right, and if you actually want to do this, I suggest Trying to publish on multiple platforms, which brings us to the next point. You establish a workflow, and uh, at first it just takes a lot of time, but then if you prepare it, you make that next step game, so a next game just a step towards the next one. So if you make it like as a streamlined process, and you want to do this in the long term, I would say this is the first time. Make a library of your assets that you can reuse. Make, uh, make sure you know your platforms. Right, should you actually be doing it in the company? I think if you want to experiment and do more artsy stuff, then you should probably do it alone and just uh, subcontract it. If you want to make bigger projects, like implement the bigger worlds, then you should go for the company thing, but 
know that is you're going to be pretty limited. In the end, you will also spend less time making games and more time managing. Right. Um, actually, I, ha I wish we like we had the culture capital phones, whatever they had it right for some games, but I wish like that in time the uh, the artsy games become more available. This is some sketches from the game we've submitted to European Union, and it failed. I'm not salty about it, but I think wouldn't it be cool to have like an existential point-and-click game where you just go through those depressing post-Soviet era hoods and just see some monsters, but not like in a God of War style, but just like some sort of loneliness or angst or an existential doubt, etc., etc., and then you just live through this. Wow. If I had money, I would make this. Anyway, what is it about? I think um, for me it's about like having fun and making games and just, um, yeah. That was a brief intro. It's like not a brief intro. We'll have some time. But yeah, basically, if you need my help, then we, um, that we as a company occasionally provide contracting services like to get started. If you want to get started in the game development, we occasionally provide contracting services to third parties such as development or just uh, art. And if you're interested to contract on our behalf, you can contact me. If you're a self-starting team of students or solo developers who want to publish their own self-funded project, I can help you out a bit. And I can also consult like bigger companies on how to publish games. Um, again, I just see it as a way to build a game development community here. Um, all right, thank you. Um, did I run through it, Ivers? What is the time? Wow, this was blazingly fast. Blazingly fast. All right, but this is was about Q&A, right? So if anyone has a questions, uh, ask me anything. Um, can you hear me? Okay, uh, so probably everybody has this question, but uh, uh, at the beginning, how did it start? Like, was it you, you and somebody else like coming together like in a garage? I uh, decided just to make games now, and uh, yeah, I don't know, working like a full-time job and then on the evenings programming something, putting something together like a long time, or did you have like free money that you can invest it? And uh, just how did you take off the company? Right, great question, thank you. Although if it was a bad question, I wouldn't say it. Like, But it is a great question, like, thank you very much. Um, right, what I wanted, um, at first I used to be a software engineer. I kinda didn't like my job that well. I started making games at the evenings, they were terrible, like even, but I got super tired of my job. I got a possible contracting gig that I could take, like Upwork style thing, and I had the backup of this. I had around seven or 8,000 euros on my account. I left my job and for the year I just tried to do whatever I wanted. Then the money ran out and I got super anxious. Then I started taking the contract gig, but at the meantime, the contract was more interesting and I was developing the game part-time. Whenever I could afford it, I would skip s uh, step back into the games. It took me around two years to just uh, kind of get started. I think 2019 was the year when I could focus on making the games entirely and this is when Merchant of the Skies actually came to life. So I suppose if you want to do it smoothly, have some savings, have a plan to do when your savings fail or when you fail, have a strong support circle of your friends who you can talk to and uh, possibly have an investor. Like it's also a pretty cool idea. You don't have to do it alone. I guess that's the point. Know that you can ask for help and People here are actually super helpful. I'm not saying someone will invest money, but mm, you can try. Um, yeah, guys, basically ask for help and uh, have it planned out. Just That's why I think just do it is a bad advice because, I mean, Kanye would tell you just make songs and be racist, but like if he does it, it works for him. But if uh, you do it, like you end up somewhere probably else. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Uh, did I answer the question? Okay. Any more? Yes. Yo, hi. How do you manage anxiety? All right. So I have yes, drugs. Uh, ADHD. I have ADHD diagnosed. So I take. Uh, uh, like at one point, the panic attack started. This is when I started to like look into it more seriously, and then I went to neuro neurologist, and they said, "Dude, you have ADHD. Like, 
take some meds and I'm like, no, I'm not gonna take the meds. Like, I'm not a junkie or something. But um, yeah, yes, now I do take the medication occasionally. It helps me with emotional regulation, dealing with stress, being here like and being pretty chill right now. Did I overshare stuff like? But yes, like uh, if you're actually feeling constant anxiety and like feel like you need to do all the stuff all, all the time and it's never enough, then there's a good chance you might actually have ADHD and like it's super treatable. Like it's not treatable, you can manage it, but yeah, um, yes. I, to be honest, when I met Merchant of the Skies, like I wasn't like diagnosed at that point and um, I think yeah, this is like when it got like super worse because when I got uh, the game published and it was and it became successful, I had a constant pressure that I need to update it and that I need to do my best all the time. And um, at one point while I was nearing release, yeah, I had like a super weird panic attacks. Like um, you would just start crying randomly. And at one point afterwards, I still like thought I can live it through. Merchant of the Sky ended. Then Luna's Fishing Garden started. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to find. Merchant of the Sky was not the first game. It was our fourth or fifth game, th but this was the most successful game. It actually got public attention, and it started... Yeah, I suppose I burned out, but then I... Sup yes, but then I was like, I'm fine. Like, we published it. I started working on the next game. Yeah, then it was like some weird stuff. Like, I had to call an amb ambulance once because I thought my... Like, I'm gonna die or something. But then, like, dude, you're having a panic attack. And I'm like, okay, I should maybe manage it. So, yeah, take your mental health seriously, guys. Like, uh, that's the point. Yeah. And go easy. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I have a lot of questions to you, but uh, I wanted to read. We have some, like, uh, questions online from the stream. Uh, so there's one question from Andre Ward. Uh, if I have an idea, what's the best way to develop it in Riga? Sorry, if I have an idea, what's the best way to develop it in Riga? Right. I guess it really depends on your skill set. First of all, I don't think you need to be a software engineer anymore if you want to make games. There are a lot of visual tooling. And um, mm, I guess it's just a broad question, and I just start losing my mind a bit over this. Mm. So, yeah, go to Global Game Jam, like, meet the people. I'm not going to be at the Global Game Jam, but, like, someone I know is going to be there, like, um, an artist of sorts. And, um, yeah, I think it the, the first point is to get introduced to the community and start asking the questions to real people who, like, make games. I cannot, like, if you specify it, I can actually maybe answer more later on, but uh, for now, I would say Global Game Jam and then go to the community and talk to people. Any more questions? I would ask, yeah. Uh, question as a, like a more, as I would now call, tra traditionally indie uh, developer, uh, how do you look at the milestones? Like, how do you, uh, basically, how do you release? Like, do you have a, like, a design document and, and you just follow it and now you release? Or do you have, like, oh, I feel like uh, it's done? Because games are never done. Like, uh, you can always work on them. Right. So first thing I want to ask, uh, say that I'm not doing it alone. I have like a support room, for example, Alex, who does uh, the uh, issue planning and stuff. Overall, I would say I have the bu budget for the games. I have the timeline, what I want to do. We usually try to work according to that timeline. Usually it never ends on time, but I already I will always stretch it by 50% or so. And if I see that we cannot make it, we just cut the features out of it. So it's better to make a smaller but well-polished game than to, to overextend. Uh, I, I guess I just take pride in the work and I just want to publish quality stuff. Yes, it's going to backfire at one point, don't get me wrong. Because, for example, Luna's Fishing Garden, uh, the second game, um, it went over budget by 50%. And uh, because, you know, you invest into it and then you think, okay, I'm getting this cool game, but, for example, the writing is not there yet. And you kind of think, okay, maybe I can get the writer from United States. And then, actually, this is what happened. I run 50 auditions and then... Yes, I think for me, and that's why I'm not a businessman. For me, it's uh, the, pri the quality of the game is uh, more important than the budget. And I, like, I think I'm just uh, lucky for now. Uh, that's uh, the perception. But I can still offer some questions. 
Before that, isn't it a bit too loud here? You're fine. Uh, what about those in the fro first two rows? Can you hear when Vladimir? Then it's just me, my problems. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, just a question. Uh, how long does it usually take to develop like a, like a size of indie games you are making? Like, and what's the budget usually around to make it? Right, as one of the developers in the company says, there are no small games, and um, normally, Luna's Fishing Garden, for example, took nine months to complete, and it's really a two-hour game where you mostly fetch stuff, and it's an incremental, but if you keep on doing and doing, I think if you want to run this as a business, and if you are serious about it, then make sure you publish at least one indie game a year. That's a good milestone. Like, take some features that you want to have, cut them down by half, and then uh, expect this to work. But yes, overall from my talks, w also with other indie developers from the industry, if you want to make this a consistent business and do not rely on hits or just one hit wonders, or uh, then one game a year is uh, pretty much a standard that people who survive those years, uh, this is how they do it. Uh, what, sorry? I suppose so, yes. Uh, yes, it makes sense. Uh, yeah, yeah. Unless your subset games, how long is it? Five, faster Than Light took five years, I think. But yes, if you can afford it and you can polish the diamond from the rough, do it. But otherwise, it's a risk. And uh, if you actually run it as a business, business part, then I would say one game a year. What's the budget, if you don't mind? That was the question. Um, Sure, I don't mind. I'm just thinking, like, it's very different from game to game. Um, I think for Merchant of the Skies, it was around, I'm, I'm afraid to lie to you, but maybe it was around 50 to 60,000 euros. But uh, you have to realize, like, mm, most of this money, okay, not most of this, maybe, okay, so maybe 70% of that sum came after the game was released. So for Merchant of the Skies, it was publish the game fast, like get the first copy of the game working, what people liked, um, and then publish it. We knew that uh, the game is getting some attention because of the wish list. We could see it and analyze it. This is exactly, this is how I estimate the success of the games, like oh, upcoming success of the games. Yes, uh, it's kind of an early, uh, it was an early access game, and uh, this is how it worked for us. Um, yes. Any more questions? So uh, we're making one game a year, and now we're going to the release. How many wish lists should we aim for? I mean, you're pulling my leg <laughs> a bit, but uh, okay, not answering like to you specifically this, but uh, I suppose. If you want to be in the popular upcoming, yet then you need around twenty thousand wish lists. Like uh, this is how what you're like uh, aiming for. There is sometimes an exclusion to this because Valve, if Valve sees that in three days or five days, if I understand it, my observations, not an NDA stuff. Uh, if from my observations, if Valve sees that there are no games that have I don't know twenty thousand wish lists, they will actually push the games with top wish lists for those next three days. So. You'd, your game needs to be either better than this, but if you want to be consistently in popular upcoming, I think it's around twenty to thirty thousand wish lists. But it's yeah, you don't need to thirty thousand. Like if you're developing alone, you don't need thirty thousand wish lists to publish a game. Like uh, take it easy. Um, roughly, uh, how 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 big percent goes from the sales to the wish list? Is the question was. Um, it really depends on the game. I think the golden standard is around 15% of the wish lists going um, on launch. Um, I can share the wish list data for Merchant of the Skies, actually. When we s published it in early access, it had 5,000 wish lists. And it still worked out really well. So it's also about the quality of the game. But it was a different time then, because Valve now doesn't feature early access games in popular, like in new uh, and trending. So 
it's harder to get there if you're an ex but when you publish the game finally you get the same benefit so uh, merchant of the skies have 5000 wish lists right now it has on full release it had 50000 wish lists and um, when it launched i think up to now it sold around 70000 copies across all platforms so uh yes again Wishlist is a good boost at start, but there were games that had 300,000 wishlists and, and Valve was like, we got to feature this game, like, and it was on the front page and it had way less reviews, for example, than Merchant of the Sky. So you still need to make a good game. 99% of it is still a good game. Okay, maybe 90% of it. You cannot, like, okay, I guess. But it's very easy to market a good game, I suppose. That's what I'm trying to say. Like... Any more? How do you test the idea? Oh. How do you test the idea of the game? How do you test the idea of the game? Right, so we actually, right, for our peaceful games, we would just make Twitter images and see how people react to the wholesome stuff. Now, it's a risky way, and I don't think like, um, for now, we just do play tests. Like the now, I I thought, why not make something that we actually like super want to make, and then we do the play tests and see if people are having fun or not. And then if people are having fun, not having fun, I get like uh, super worried about it, and I'm like, I gotta push everyone and just yeah, and then usually it turns out okay because it gets a bit more fun. And uh, again, I wouldn't be able to do it without my team, so. Um, yeah, I suppose I should clarify because we kind of say good game 99% marketing. <sighs> I guess if you want to have a game that sells around a thousand copies over time, it's not going to be super difficult. Um, you really just need to invest in art, some amount of money. I would say with a budget of 5,000 and... Uh, and it's like a top number. It's I think it can be done with less. And if you just make put in your work by yourself as a developer, it's going to work out. But uh, if you can do everything, it's also going to work out. Uh, in a way. But just don't expect 10,000 of copies sold unless you have a game with spiders, with light swords, I suppose. But uh, no, like... Uh, Keep it real, look at the data. The basic entry, if you don't plan to be a millionaire, like it's very simple, you don't need to make a very hard game, like very super complex game. And don't confuse complexity with depth, please, like like the Nolan did in Tenet. Sorry if anyone likes Tenet. Um, basically make something simple, make something good, just work on some cool idea that you enjoy making. Don't stretch it over five years, scale it down, the and um, this is how I would success say you would maximize your chances and appreciate what you're doing. Like, like consider what, again, opportunity costs. If my game sells zero copies, what am I getting? If Stories from the Outbreak is getting zero copies, I'm getting an amazing game in my portfolio that I'm super proud of. And uh, that's how I perceive it. Yeah, but it's again uh, about your values and stuff. If you want to maximize money, then you need to act differently. Um, sorry. Not sorry. Why am I apologizing about this? Carry on. Simonis, did you have a question? I will pass it to Simonis. But the yeah. did we ha do we have time? What yeah. time is it? Okay. So we have a couple more questions from the chat of the stream. I will read them all out, and you can just answer which one you want to answer. Uh, so there is one question which is, is there a demand for people who write story scripts, for example, people with good imagination but not interested specifically in programming? Another question is, do you only make indie games and have you thought about making different genre games? Okay, I will answer the ones that I still remember and then I will ask about the second one. Okay, I might remember the both ones. The first one was about the writing. So, the writing thing, I really think that some 
you need experience. When I was picking a writer, I was essentially looking at experience first and foremost. And um, if you actually want to get this, to become a game development writer, I would say you need to have like a good examples. Not exactly, maybe not commercial games, but if you have a visual novel or something made in the engine without the programming, it would already put you above people who are just good at writing. So um, you don't need to be a programmer. Look at the visual scripting. There are actually engines for the visual novels. Laura, how are you making your game? Uh, visual scripting and game creator. So game creator plus visuals, like visual scripting. You can actually do it. You don't need to be a cool programmer. Like, sorry, I don't mean that you're a bad programmer. Oh, God. I am. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I I mean I had one game with made like just um uh, I don't know. I guess the entry is uh, easier. I that's what I want to say. Yeah, like uh, blueprints. Yeah. I'd say if you want to concentrate on uh, on writing just make a visual novel thing in uh, the engines that are already provided. There are engines for text games. I would say this is a start and then you look Twine for example and uh, it actually puts you again above the people who never made anything, have it published. And the second one, the genre of indie games, I suppose I don't perceive the indie genre more like a style of living, although <sighs> what does an indie mean? No, like by Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, no, indie means that you do whatever you want in a way that you are not afraid of your creative vision, that you don't want to say, like, that you want to convey a message and then you are not afraid to say it or just, like, yeah, you take experiments. You know how the popular movies look at the indie movies and take, like, the cool stuff from them? Essentially, indie is what does... I'm not saying I'm the one who does it, but good indie games that actually provide some cool new mechanics that AAA games are not always are um, confident in making. So it's like a trailblazing stuff and maybe something just works out. This is how I perceive it. So indie is just doing what you want to do. Technically, yes. Yeah. That was like, we had so many discussions of what can be counted as indie or not. Um, yeah, to me it's just making games and having fun, I suppose. Uh, if I make an indie strategy game, it's still a strategy game, but it's it's not a genre, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose so. Right. Right. Anyone else has a question? Right. I will give it to Simonis and then to you. Uh, my question was, uh, how do you market your games and how do you advertise them? Right, so this is the tougher questions. As usually, uh, that's why I say 99% of games is uh, like, the 99% of the game really marketing is like having a game, a good game. I think it worked, the marketing worked because the wholesome games just need to have a good picture, first and foremost. When Helen or the artist or... Um, Antoinette, the artist from New Zealand, were drawing things for Merchant of the Skies or Luna's Fishing Garden. We would put it on Twitter. We would see that it gets a lot of likes. And then it confirmed those idea would work and we would proceed to make them. And essentially, when we make the next peaceful game, this is going to be the same way. Uh, we put the art through Screenshot Saturday, hashtag on Twitter, if it's still alive, or Mastodon or something. And then um, we see how people react. And if people react, then we make this type of game. But this applies to wholesome games. For RPG games, I suppose some people find the subreddits, the niche subreddits that look like their game. I've seen twin stick shooters do this. They post the information about the game in, uh, how was it called, the game by Vlambeer, the first one, the twin stick shooter. Nuclear, Nuclear Throne. Nuclear Throne. There was the very popular twin stick shooter game. And then people who make the clones of that game, they would go to Nuclear Throne subreddit and say, hey guys, I'm making this kind of game. So. The marketing process is creative by itself, I suppose, but you don't have much, not you specifically. For example, I don't have enough energy when I do this, so make something that is like visually appealing at <laughs> most. That's my suggestion. Do you spend money on it? Uh, 
I had some Reddit ads when I was launching the Lazy Galaxy, but I had a very specific niche audience, and it actually, I think it had one cent per click, which actually I think it was a very decent and like conversion ratio. I couldn't measure it, but I think for one hundred dollars spent, I have earned around five hundred dollars, uh, and that time, and I think it w went really well. But like the audience was very niche, and you couldn't really scale it, so. For niche games, it might be easier, but you need to know, like, really where to market it. Um, you had one more question. Um, okay, uh, two things. Uh, one's like more a comment or just uh, how to say thing that I noticed like recently in the gaming world. Uh, you mentioned that like to market a game, you need like a good game. I would argue about this because like we have really two good examples: uh, Cyberpunk 2077 and No Man's Sky. Two games that the marketing team was just pulling, going full cylinders, had like a marketing, I don't know, probably a couple millions, probably blow most of their budget to the marketing. And we know how those games turned out, right? Uh, the thing is that, like, m maybe this is more like in the AAA industry going on or with the bigger companies, that, like, not necessarily you need, like, a really good game to sell it. You just need, like, the really market it in a really good way just to pr show people what they want to see like fulfill their like deepest fantasy streams like and not necessarily deliver on it because there's still those games sold I uh, know cyberpunk sold like 15 million copies just a couple days week maximum and yeah they get sued but <laughs> they paid the settlement two million but they they went out like with a billion profit like not profit but income from the game so uh, that's one thing and the other thing I wanted to ask is that I saw you are publishing mostly on all platforms but not PlayStation what's the story behind that and uh, one thing I heard that Sony has like a really bad relationship with the indie games and studios like in the past I know that they are like making up for it in the last maybe half year but still the situation is not like really great what I hear at least what I hear at least and not from my experience and basically from the stuff that I read in uh, indie game journals and not from anything that I have encountered in my life. Um, the dev kits might be a bit pricier and some ex developers for example that say that they get stuff for free but some other journals publish the news that some developers do not get this stuff and they have to pay in thousands to get the dev kits. Uh, I assume I've read something like this, and it never happened to me. That's why I never published on Sony PlayStation. Yes. Sorry? Uh, yes. Yes, I know. Right. All right. Yes, like, uh, I had, like, the old experience, and uh, I cannot, like, uh, convey anything about it. It's only what I've read in the journals. Um and also because I have an NDA like signed, but yes, like uh, um, from the public information that you can find online, this is I'm citing it, not saying my experience. Thank you. Uh, okay, and uh, yes, uh, I cannot comment on AAA gaming, but for example, if Sony PlayStation uh, features No Man's Sky, they people will get interested and let's be honest no man's sky was looking like a thousand bucks like uh, like a million bucks no man's sky was looking really good cyberpunk was really looking really good uh it's the same for marketing coldwell games g in this regard graphics sells games good reviews keep them afloat and uh, allow you to sell copies unless you're like super triple a fifa stuff or cyberpunk stuff if you manage to get uh featured by a platform then your initial boost of sale is going to be very notable this is correct but if you are not able to maintain the review amount then your sales will drop if you get mixed rating on steam like yellow rating on steam forget about uh, having more sales like this is where a significant drop of sales start so make a uh, pretty games to attract attention make good gameplay to actually get reviews and keep the tail going that's what I would say also if you actually want to maximize your chances like try to make um, games that generate stories of sorts 
I'm not saying stories from the outbreak, like, but RimWorld, uh, you can watch his presentation online and this is essentially the consensus, like the content, like because of the game situations, the content creates itself, Dwarven Fortress, it's the same one. Uh, it's the long story, people keep playing it, uh, it uh, increases exposure and um, uh, I think for the indies, it's also a very viable way, which I haven't touched yet, but anyone else had a question? Do you want the microphone? Or yeah, I maybe I missed a couple of questions, but my, uh, my question was about the, mar like the most not exciting thing about the marketing and uh, uh, which channels do you like um, embrace the most? Like, which do you think are the best for the, not, not the numbers maybe, but for the following for the community? Is anyone using Twitter here? Right. Have anyone got like lots of suggestions in the last days about weird posts? Wow, our Twitter account like had purple stars like from Latvian influencers like one girl who was on Tinder, one girl who was like complaining about some stuff, just weir weird stuff. But Twitter is our ma main channel. channel. Uh, but, and Discord is to communicate with uh, the audience. I know some people get anxious about maintaining a million channels like right from the start. Just pick something that you use and you know how to pe reach the people. Honestly, having one channel is enough, especially if you do it solo. Uh, yeah, I was... Yeah. And, uh, related question. Rel uh, actually, uh, yeah, you mentioned Twitter and uh, do you do dev blogs and uh, do you see like any uh, sort of, um, how to say it, like the positive influence on your games like from the reception of your, like, like basically if how to say, like, hard to formulate the question, but uh, yeah, do you see any value in the reception from the dev blogs and... Um right, thank you. Has anyone here uh, had a diary when they were a kid? Or like an adult? I have a diary, I like write stuff there occasionally. Anyway, yes, cool, thank you, <laughs> at least someone. <laughs> yes, like diaries are cool. Anyway, um... I guess I treat the devlogs mostly as a diary of sorts. I write something down, it helps me clear my mind, but it does help with the audience that already exists, but people who don't know about your game or don't know about your company, I don't think they will care unless you make really good devlogs like Satisfactory did. Um, they had like, they invested into this, but they had a very cool like triple A level game. So um, do the devlogs if you, are interested in it, and if you want to do the devlogs. That's how I would say it. It's in the way, like, right, do only the stuff that you want to do, publish the game, that's pretty much everything else. Anything else is like... Mm. Just a second, I caught on the, the mind loop. Should you do devlogs or not? Yep, yeah, do it only if you want, like this dan so the dancing song. You can dance if you want to. You can leave your fans behind. Because your friends don't dance, and if they don't dance, then they are no friends of mine. <laughs> anyway, no, yes. Like, uh, basically, early sort of reception, early, early reception for your, like, your idea, like basically you're putting together some, I don't know, some visuals or something, and people say, ah, like, oh, dude, that sucks. Like, come on, like, uh, you can do better. <laughs> Most people uh, don't care about the bad ideas, like, unless they're your followers. Uh, you, ma you, you make a bad post online. You're not going to get uh, angry comments. Um, when we manage, we post uh, the art for the games before we actually start developing, that we do. Anything else, we don't do devlogs until there is significantly something that we want to show. I do monthly devlogs with company reports when I actually tell how things are going within the company. And um, this is pretty much uh, that. I've seen some devlogs blow up. But they were about, there was a game dev post on Reddit one time ago about the guy who said he was trying TikTok to market games and he was getting like uh, 500 views for his pixelated or voxel game. And then he make a fake thing like, I'm making a cool MMO about Star Wars universe. Like, and he posted cool concept art from Star Wars and he got like 10 million views and lots of likes on this. Again, like, if your game looks cool, then I suppose it would work if you do it honestly, but um, have a pretty game. That's what I want to say if you 
actually <sighs> won't have a success. Anyone else has a question? Laura, I feel so bad about you having to stand up. I'm so sorry. It's okay because we're actually starting to run out of time. So last question from me. Let's imagine uh, a person who has a normal stable job and he maybe in his free time or maybe commercially has done one, two games and now he wants to quit his job and do games full time, make his own company. Name first three things he should do or think about. Right. The so the first one, have a backup plan, like what you do if things fails. This is the first thing you actually have to do. Um, the second one, I suppose... Wow, I'm not going to like have a responsibility course. If you have a family and kids, like, don't do it, I guess. Uh, I guess do it if you have an external funding, honestly. Like, if you can sustain yourself and uh, if you have people depend on you, like... Um, and you know that they will be okay, then do it. Like, think about it. If you take the responsibility about something, stick to it. And third one, I guess, just keep making progress and uh, make the actual game. Like, even if you cannot... The first part is should be about making the games. Like, you cannot post on Twitter, fine, don't post on Twitter. Just um, make the damn game. Because there are examples of people... You're not going to be an example, like, statistically speaking, but there are examples of people who made one or two posts on launch and their games kind of worked. Again, statistically speaking, it's probably not going to happen to you. But if you have a choice about posting on Twitter or making, like, finishing the game, just finish the game, that I would say. Ideally, do both, but yeah. Great. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. If you have any more questions, then you can catch him. Are you going to be in the meeting? I was thinking about going dancing, but... Um, what I wanted to say, thank you for the questions, like everyone, and uh, thank you for having me. If anyone actually has the questions, I'm probably going to be here 20 or so minutes. Uh, yeah, I guess I want to encourage you like to, wow, no smart words for me. Just live your life, make games if you want to, take responsibility for your actions, uh, don't be an asshole to others, and uh, be kind to yourself first and foremost, and just, uh, Take it day by day, okay? Um, thank you. Round of applause. <laughs>